Welcome to Step Into the Story. Incredible conversations of how the Bible changes lives, changes families, and changes communities across the globe. And here's your host, Phil Tuttle of Walk Through the Bible. Welcome to Step Into the Story, where each episode is a powerful conversation about God, the Bible, and the story of a life changed. We talk with guests about how God has intersected their story with his story and how the Bible is changing everything about their lives. We're so glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us. And you're going to love this conversation with today's guest, Trevin Wax. Trevin, welcome to Step Into the Story. Thank you for having me. So honored to be here. So Trevin, um, tell me the derivation and the circumstances of your name. You are the first ever Trevin that I have had the pleasure of of meeting. Do you know the, the background to that name? I do. I do. Um, actually, my, my grandfather's name on my, my dad's side is Nevin, and um, my father's name is Kevin. And so when they were looking to, to, to have a third generation, they looked for another Evan-type name, and I don't know exactly where they they discovered it. it uh, you know, it is there are other people out there named Trevin that are even spelled the same way. It just tends to be more of a of a rare name out there. Um, our son, though, actually, he has my initials and my middle name, but his name is Timothy. We we had a, we, we chose a Bible name because he's being half Romanian. Uh, we wanted a, a, a name that would go in both languages. So um, the tradition has ended, but there's Nevin, Kevin, and Trevin. And that's where the, the, the der- derivation comes from. Wow. That was not the answer I was expecting. I was so <laughs> excited because I had found out that the name Trevin actually means it's old English for a fair city. And you put that together with wax. And I thought you were going to unfold this great story about generations of candle makers from some small towns uh, in England. But we'll, we'll, go with, we'll go with the Evan, 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 Kevin, Trevin. We'll, we'll go with, with that story <laughs> because I know you know better than we do. Uh, you know, you mentioned that your son is, ha- is half Romanian. And um, you and your wife, I want to hear more about this. I mean, you, you are um, a pastor. You've been a pastor. Uh, you are a prolific author. You have an important leadership role with Lifeway as Senior VP for Theology and Communications. Um, Walk Through the Bible, the ministry I lead, has had great partnership with Lifeway through the decades. And so that's that's really close, even though you and I have never met face-to-face. We've we've got that in common. And um, uh, there's lots of things about that that I want to explore. But let's start on the family side of things. Um, Tell me about your marriage. Is it is it Karina or Corinna? How's it pronounced? Karina is uh, is is how it's pronounced. Yeah. Uh, all right, I gotta hear I gotta hear your love story, and she is not here to contradict any of the details. So let's go with your version of it, just like we went with your version of the name Trevin. Um, how did well, God bring the two of you together? Well, I I sensed as a teenager the um, I, I had a I had gone over and and I had gone to Romania and had done several mission trips as a teenager. Um, and, you know, in that decade after the uh, after communism fell there, after the, the dictator was was removed. Um, and uh, during that time, by, by the time I finished high school and before I went to college, I sent the Lord uh, calling me to mission work there uh, on a more permanent basis. And so I left um, as a 19 year old, moved over to Romania, attended a Christian college there for five years learned the language, was immersed in the culture, did a lot of ministry there. Uh, and shortly after I moved there, Karina and I met uh, just a group of friends that were doing uh, doing ministry together in a particular village uh, in the in the area around where um, where, where our city was. Uh, we were at both of the same schools. She was a couple years uh, older in, in school. But uh, uh, about a year after I moved there, uh, we were both tasked with starting an Awana group. You may be familiar with the, sure. the kids ministry, Awana, uh, to start an Awana group in the village where I had been most active. And she had a lot of connections with Awana there. And so we got to know each other pretty, pretty well, uh, from having, um, traveled together, uh, from the city to the train station to, 
taking the train into the village, then getting out, then walking a couple miles from the train station into the village, uh, setting up Awana, um, you know, training leaders, working with the kids, having a, a, an afternoon lunch, and then going back to that train station. And you put it all together, and we, we spent quite a bit of time together, uh, really forged in ministry from the very beginning. Wow. And so uh, that's how we got to know each other, and uh, we, we got married about a year after that. Wow, and God's blessed you with some kids. Tell us about your children. Yes, our, our oldest, Timothy, that I mentioned, is uh, about to be a senior in high school. And then we have um, uh, our daughter, uh, Julia, is about to be in eighth grade. And then we have um, a son, David, who's about to turn eight. So uh, three three great kids, and uh, the Lord has, has really blessed us um, over these years. So have your kids been raised bilingual? So our oldest two um, are better than our youngest on that front. Um, I don't know exactly why that's the case. When my my wife and I Romanian at home, um, generally, even though she's very fluent in English, and um, uh, we just you know the we 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 tend to, to talk in Romanian. Um, and so our oldest, he actually we were still living in Romania when he was born. So he his earliest year was was there and was pretty much all Romanian all the time for the first couple of years of his life. So he is, um, understands probably 80% of anything we tell him in Romanian. He tends to respond in English, not Romanian though. Um, our daughter is maybe 50, 60%. Um, and then our, our youngest is just really, really <laughs> doesn't, doesn't get much or what. And I don't know why that's the, the difference that different families that have, uh, are, uh, um, cross-cultural in this way will tell you it's it's strange how different kids pick up the language and how kids kids don't so yep i've um, heard that before i think it's so cool that you know with karina going your direction and moving here that that you chose to communicate with her at home through romanian which is you know the the language of her heart and the language that your relationship was was formed and that's that's really cool that you chose to do that well, it was it wasn't uh, even that much of a conscious choice. There were there were times that we, uh, after you know uh, when we had our our son, there were times when we were still living over there where we thought, what if we should speak more English to each other so that our kids, you know, will our our, our oldest son he where that he would be around English some too and learn English. But what what happened was, I mean, it just didn't feel natural for us to speak to each other in English um, as much because we had. Um, met and fallen in love and gotten married in Romanian and all the rest. So it just, mm. even now, you know, we, we, we all have conversations in English when our kids are around or sometimes we know with other people around, but generally speaking, when we're just talking to the two of us, we, we, we tend to revert back to Romania. Ah, that's great. I love Romania. Walk Through the Bible has worked in about 130 countries and we've got 10 regional hubs outside the United States and, and for Eastern Europe, our hub is in, in Romania, actually in Timisoara. So I've been able to travel there several times. I, I, I love Romania, love the people there. Um, wanna, wanna talk to you some about your role at Lifeway and specifically tell us about the Gospel Project. I, I love what y'all are doing with that. Yes, yeah, so um, I came to Lifeway about uh, ten and a half years ago, and um, it actually about to transition into a into a new role uh, elsewhere here pretty soon. But this last ten and a half years, um, my my main role, at least initially with coming, was uh, to help start a curriculum that would be used in churches. Uh, for um, uh, initially, it was just I was going to be involved in the the, the version for adults. Uh, but after I, I was there a little bit, it, it, it quickly it expanded into, well, let's do this for kids and for students as well. Mm. Um, and so the, the first you know, year and a half or so, I, it, was a, it was a lot of planning, a lot of preparation, a lot of putting together of what the curriculum would look like, uh, what topics we would cover. But the big idea behind it from the very beginning was how do we show that all of the Bible – uh, is really telling one story, one story that points to Jesus at the center. Yes, that was really the the big idea. Was how do we how do we help people read the Bible as one big story rather than 
you know, just looking at it for some inspirational tidbits of, you know, advice for your daily life or, or looking at it for, you know, just a bunch of Bible stories that are, that teach moral uh, truths uh, or provide you with good examples, um, entertaining stories for kids. Like we, we wanted to make sure that we were not just going through the Bible, but that we were showing how all the Bible fits together. And I, I know that's a passion and, and uh, something that uh, Walk Through the Bible has done so well over the years as well. And um, so the Lord has really blessed it. Um, it has, um, it's being used in multiple countries now. It's been translated into different languages. It's, uh, it launched in 2012. It's uh, on a three-year cycle, and we're about to begin the fourth. A three-year cycle that takes people through the Bible, um, and I, it, it's it certainly has been, um, it, it has been more successful than anything that we might have dreamed at the outset. And I think that something we have to have a lot of gratitude uh, to the Lord for, for blessing it like He has. Oh uh, well, thank you so much for your work, not only your personal writing with Al, but but in a lot of ways leading that team. Um, you're right; that's close to my heart. You know, for, for so many people, the Bible is, it's a collection of fragments. You know, it's, it's individual pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And it's so easy to go through your whole Christian experience just with these random pieces. And, you know, we, we get to do that in our live events, OT Live and NT Live. And I just see what you do as a, as a wonderful follow-up to that. And um, so, so thank you so much for your, your work with that. I know you've written a lot of books. Um, I, I will tell you that um, one of the newer ones, The Multidimensional Leader, is on my list of upcoming reads. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. And uh, just th- thank you for all the writing that you've been doing. I um, want to also talk some about your work with the Gospel Coalition. And um, the Gospel Coalition is one of those entities that doesn't always stress its own name. Um, but Gospel Coalition is doing some fantastic work. How would you summarize the mission of Gospel Coalition in a couple of sentences? Well, um, I, I'm not a council member, so I, I want to make sure I get this right. I'm a, I'm a columnist there on the website. But um, what, what the Gospel Coalition is all about is renewing the church with the gospel of Jesus Christ for the times that we find ourselves in. And so it is it, it's trying to, to be the best of, um, you know, what we would say would be that theologically evangelical impulse of we need the church needs to be consistently and constantly renewed uh, and, and to grow in its confidence in the power of the gospel, but also in its uh, um, uh, the passion to reach out to, to other people and to, uh, to share the good news of Jesus. So um, what the Gospel Coalition's website does, and one of the reasons I love to partner with them is uh, they're, they're con- the editorial team there and the writers, they're constantly thinking of ways in which we can equip the local church, um, in, in, equip the local church, inspire the local church, inform the local church, um, uh, instruct the local church in, in all sorts of ways. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to, to write there and to be able to partner uh, with with some of the people on that team, they just they do fantastic work, and I'm 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 deeply encouraged by the response that they've received at the work that they do. Mm. Yeah, I love that blend of the truth hasn't changed; it's absolutely timeless. But but how each new generation gets reached, it it really requires change and innovation and adaptation and. Gospel Coalition just, I think, is is leading the way with that. Thanks for listening to this episode of Step Into the Story with Phil Tuttle. We wanted to take a quick pause and tell you about a new small group Bible study from Phil and Walk Through the Bible entitled Refuge, Finding Home in a World of Change. Refuge is a story of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz, and it took place during the time of the Judges. It was a time when Israel indulged in radical individualism, frequent wars, and idol worship. When we look at our world today with pain, confusion, displaced people, a pandemic, and the fear and loss it's created, things seem awfully similar to the time of Ruth, where so many are looking for home in a world of constant change. We invite you to explore this great new Bible study, Refuge, 
and discover how God used a grieving widow, a faithful foreigner, and a man of standing to show us how we find our true home and refuge in Him and Him alone. You can find out more about this new resource by visiting walkthrough.org slash refuge. That's W-A-L-K-T-H-R-U dot org slash refuge. Hey, take a walk and change the world. One of the things that I stumbled across when I was when I was digging through, you you are all over the internet as a result of, of being so prolific. Um, but one of the things that I stumbled across was a a video and and also attached article that you did on signs of hope for the next generation. And I know there are so many people that will go, well, I don't see any signs of hope for the next generation. You know, we hear every time a new Barna uh, study comes out, I kind of flinch and, you know, I I believe their conclusions. I really do. And I respect their methodology and research, but I kind of cringe and I, you know, I begin reading and there's a lot of, there's a lot of bad news. And just the thought, as you express it, I agree that there are signs of hope for the next generation in the church. But um, can you take us through some of the those signs that, that you identify? Because I think this will be a tremendous encouragement to moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas who are listening to this, as well as, as members of upcoming generations that are, are really sick of everybody just writing them off. So tell us some of the good things you discovered. Well, sometimes the, the good things are actually the flip sides of what would appear at first to be bad news, right? Because you, you, what you find is with every staff that you see or research survey, you find that there are opportunities that come with, with challenges. Um, and so, so, you know, for example, one challenge that you see in a lot of the research surveys and Barna and things and others as well is a decline of religiosity among Americans, a decline of church membership. Recently, we just saw some stats on that. Um, fewer and fewer millennials and those who would be behind that, the gen, Generation Z or iGen, whatever you might call that generation behind the millennials, uh, fewer and fewer of them actually identify as Christian. Um, so you look at that and you think, well, where's the, what's the good news in that? Well, um, you know, that the decline itself isn't good news, but um, it is good and it is a sign of hope, I think, that younger Christians already expect to be a countercultural minority. And so the younger Christians that are passionate about their faith are willing to be passionate even if there's a social cost involved. And I think that's something that should give us some encouragement. Um, um, another thing that is— uh, Well, before you go to the next one, let's stay, let's stay on sure. that one. Uh, you know, I think, I think even just your, experiencing, your experience ministering Romania had to—you have to recognize the value— of the church embracing a minority position and the power that comes from that, like, like probably few Americans would. I mean, how does, how does your time in Romania I- I inform your view that, hey, that's a really positive thing that, that we're seeing in millennials and Gen Zers? Well, it's, it's actually the, the, the church not being as dominant as it is, as it has been in the United States. It's actually the norm for many churches in many other parts of the world. Um, I mean, we're seeing a lot of, um, seeing reports out of uh, many countries right now, including China and others, where the places where there is social resistance and even political pressure against the church, um, there tends to still be a lot of commitment from people from within the church. Um, Now, that, you know, being in the minority certainly has its challenges as well. Um, and I wouldn't want to romanticize that, even based on my experience in Romania, uh, being part of, uh, um, you know, the evangelicals in, my, in Romania are certainly a minority. Um, and there were challenges that came alongside with that as well. But there is a, um, uh, you know, when, when you're already paying a something of a social cost, uh, what that tends to do is parents do that. And, and this leads me to other signs of hope as 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 families um, recognize that there is a picking up the cross to follow Jesus, that there is a self-denial at the heart of Christianity where you are putting aside your own preferences, your own comforts, things like that. Um, what it tends to do is it tends to create a sense of belonging and boldness in the younger generation. Mm-hmm. So 
um, so, you know, some, some people want to get rid of that resistance and they, and they may leave the church or leave the faith, but many others actually become more devout because they, th- their faith must mean something to them in order to be able to withstand the social pressures that are there. So um, it, it, there is a purifying effect to some of those pressures as well that I think we do well to consider. Yeah, I know you've done some some teaching at Wheaton College, and um, that's where my wife and I met and fell in love um, clear back in the class of 1980, and I've served on the Board of Visitors there recently. Uh, but, you know, you're probably familiar with Ed Stetzer. Some of his work really parallels this. We're looking at the church in America that, oh, it's in decline, it's in decline. And, but But if you break it out and say, you know, that's really – made up of several groups. I mean, there's the committed Christians, then there's kind of more the the casual Christians, and then there's those who are just the cultural Christians, kind of by default. I'm a Christian. I was born here, and I'm not Muslim. I'm not Jewish, so I guess I'm Christian. Right. And and that most of the decline has been in the casual and, um, you know, in the cultural categories, whereas the committed Christians, that that number is is holding its own and in some glorious places even even growing and that that really dovetails with this research that that you're talking about and that is the expectation that's the expectation of of my kids and and so how do you how do you change the world they don't view that as well you're going to change that politically you know we're the we're the silent majority. We're going to get the people in there who agree with our values, and we're just going to fix it. And, you know, you know, my kids would look at that and go, that doesn't square very much with how Jesus operated, that's for sure. Well, it's, it's a different, it's a shift in sensibilities, because when you look at the younger generation, a lot of them already, they, 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 they wouldn't look first and foremost to politics to see where social change is going to take place that is going to, to drive cultural changes that would be in favor of Christianity. What they will tend to do is think more pastorally, what are the pastoral implications of the kind of secularizing society that we live in? How do we, how do we, we, we live as a minority, as a creative, a moral minority in this culture rather than a majority? And so it does, um, it does lead to different sensibilities, different um, expectations as to what you can achieve through the political process. Now, a lot of young people still are politically minded. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of political polarization in the church, just like there is in the culture, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But but um, it, they're not generally looking at politics as achieving the same things that maybe their parents or grandparents might have, have expected, uh, just based on some of that, that generational difference. Right, right. What are some of the other signs of hope that, that you see in, in generations that are, are following, at least following me, you're probably right in the middle of millennials. But um, what are some of the signs of hope that you see? Well, one of the things I think that is most encouraging, and I've actually seen it more research, even more recently, that's backing this up even more. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading Christian Smith, who's a, 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 a well-known sociologist. He's now writing a book on family, on faith formation with the families. But uh, one of the signs that the research was already pointing to a few years ago that I'm even more excited to see backed up is that um, it really goes back to the basics of what formation of Christians look like from generation to generation. And there's a lot to be said for parents and what and, and the influence that parents have on on their kids. Now, this is not a one-size-fits-all thing where you know, you you do these particular things, and then your kids are necessarily going to wind up, you know, being faithful Christians. But there are uh, in these studies that are coming out that are showing there 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 is a really powerful effect um, when there are um, you know moms and dads who are talking about matters related to faith and living out their faith in informal settings, not just informal settings. So not just we go to church where I put my kids in a youth group or I send them to camp once every summer and things like that, but where it's, it's evident in the lives of the, uh, of the parents and of the family that, that there is Bible reading going on and that prayer actually takes place and that there are conversations about this. And, and what, what I think a sign of hope for me is that this is what we read about in the book of Deuteronomy where it talks about it. Tells, there, I was just thinking how that syncs with Deuteronomy 6. 
Absolutely. It does it. It does it. Tell, Deuteronomy 6 makes it very clear that what one of the things you are to do as parents, Moses giving the instruction, is to be talking about uh, uh, the law, the Old Testament law, talking about the law when you rise and when you go to sleep and when you eat and when you come in and out of your house and it's got, you know, and having your house decorated with things that are going to remind you of, uh, of, uh, um, of, of scripture and the Lord and putting him first. And so, I mean, this, I guess what's encouraging to me is to say, you know, human nature, a lot of things change. The culture changes, the world changes. There's a lot of things shifting, but a lot of the basics don't change. Um, and when it comes to faith formation from within the family, what it means for, for young people to, uh, to, to, to come to faith, to grow, to develop as Christians. A lot of these things are constant. Yes. The, the methods may change, but a lot of the, uh, a lot of this, it's just, we're back to the basics. And that gives me hope because if you feel hopeless, you can look out and you can say, well, I can't change the world, but maybe I can, I can be part of changing the culture of my home. Maybe I can be part of changing the culture of my church changing the culture in my community by the by the way that I lead, by the way that I live, by the way that I reach, uh, I, I think to serve my family and others. Mm. Yeah, that idea of, you know, really thinking globally, but but living locally and seeking to have the greatest impact on those we have the most contact with. You know, our, our families of a few years ahead of yours, our, our uh, kids are 33 and 30 now. And, um, you know, they're, they're adults and my wife and I will have conversations and it's, it's, there's no doubt in my mind that they picked up a lot more, you know, Deuteronomy six talks about teach them, teach them, teach them. And right. we sure tried to do some of that. And I mean, they've heard me preach more times than anybody should, should be subjected to their dad preaching, but there's no doubt in my mind that in terms of values and, and beliefs. I, I call it the theology of the minivan. I mean, just, just going back mm. and forth. And when they were young, it was like a huge deal for them to, hey, I'm going here to teach. Why don't you fly with me? We'll get that time together. And that, you know, that works pretty good up until late elementary school. And then you get beyond that. And, and then it's like, well, are mom and dad showing up at my stuff? You know, are they in, mm. in mm -hmm. my world? And um, I just think the whole concept of incarnational parenting, you know, following the example of God, what did he do? He wants us to come and be with him, but, but he humbled himself. He emptied himself. He came down to earth to be in our world. And whether that means, you know, volunteering to coach on a, on a baseball team or, or, you know, whether, whether that means you show up for that band concert or that ballet recital and, our, our house was just the place where people ended up after our kids' activities. And we spent a lot of money on pizza, and, you know, we had a fair amount of damage with my son and his crazy friends to our house from time to time. But, but man, that's, that's where they lived life. And I, um, I'm, I'm so encouraged to hear that that wasn't just some kind of just anecdotal Oh wow, we got lucky, and that seems to be working in our home. But but there actually is research to back that up. What an encouragement that's got to be to parents, and you know, and and to to parents whose kids are grown, and you know, maybe they're not following the Lord now. The last chapter has not been written. There's hope in those relationships. It's about keeping the relationship open and the 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 role of grandparents. Um, you know, in, in being able to even maybe our kids aren't raising our grandkids exactly like we wish, but the just the power of, of a grandparent. So I just I, I'm so excited about that. It, uh, is there any is there one other sign of hope that that you can share with us today or any other observations along those lines you would make? Well, I've I've been encouraged as well uh, to, to see that um, uh Churches that are, are are involving people in their in their in in leadership, younger people in leadership, quickly um, are are seeing younger people stay and not leave the church as much. So, you know, you see these statistics, and they they can be pretty discouraging. A lot, you know, the majority of young people that grow up in evangelical churches, um, at least 
at least a year or more during their college years will be missing from the church, mm-hmm. uh, won't, won't be attending church. Uh, that's a big problem. You can call it, I call it the gap year. Uh, you know, we, we, we say this gap in between high school and college for some. I took a gap year my, myself, but I'm calling it now. This is the church gap year where they're, you're at least, in, in, sometimes it's more than a year, but you'll have young people not showing up at church. So you can look at all of the reasons why that might be the case, but you should also look at, and I've been encouraged to see some life research done on, okay, what about the, what about the kids who never left? What about, um, what, you know, what, what, what was common in their experience? One of the, and one of the encouraging things to see about that uh, was that um, churches, and it doesn't matter the size, it doesn't matter all of the bells and whistles or being the coolest church in town or whatnot, but churches that tended to involve younger people in ministry, um, in service, seeing them not only as spectators, but as participants right. in the mission of God, um, seeing them as not people to just be catered to, but to actually serve. Um, you see, you see more of a retention there because young people, uh, they, they jump at the responsibility and they, and they, they plug in, they understand the mission of the congregation. They want to be part of, uh, serving others. And they recognize that it's not just that the church is making a place for them to feel comfortable, but that the church recognizes them as partners in, uh, in, in doing what God has called us to do. Amen to that. I cringe every time uh, I'll, I'll hear a pastor say, you know, and here's our kids. Let's have a round of applause for the church of tomorrow. <sighs> you, you know, it's, it's like, no, that's the church of today. And this idea of, hey, spend 10 years, 15 years, absorb all this stuff, file it away, because someday you're going you're gonna to need this to share it with other people. And I, I, I could not agree more with that because it's, it's you know, there's a, there's a desire among kids. They, they want to do something. And this idea of a, of a 15 or 20 year habit of just be consumers. But, but then when you turn, a, a, when you get to be an adult, then, you know, then now it's time to go to work. And that's a tough habit to turn around. So, and I could not agree more with you about that. Um, Trevin, as we, as we wrap up our time together, a c- couple questions. First, um, if this has stirred curiosity about your ministry and our listeners, what's the best way for them to uh, follow you and, and learn some more from you? Well, uh, they can always just go to my website. If you just go to trevinwax.com, you'll, it'll take you to my column at the Gospel Coalition where I write uh, two or three times a week. Um, I'm also on, on Twitter and Facebook uh, because of that unique name. It's pretty easy to find me if you if you do a search. Uh, but I'd love to connect with um, uh, with different people and, to, and readers of, of my books, which you can find um, anywhere uh, generally that, that books are sold. Well, great. I sure would encourage our listeners to do that. And one more thing, Trevin, what are a couple of things that I can pray for you uh, right now before we let you go? Well, I, I would uh, ask you to, to pray that uh, my wife and I uh, are, that we will be faithful parents in these years as our kids are getting older. You know, we're in that stage of life where you have a really long days and really short years, mm. uh, as they say. And so um, that would be something to pray for, that we will be faithful in our own parenting as we seek to pass on the gospel to the next generation. Um, and... Um, and also that um, uh, you would pray for us as we make decisions regarding uh, the future and um, where the Lord would uh, would have us um, serve uh, in ministry, um, and that we would um, find the you know be be right where He wants us to be, uh, serving in our church, serving in our community, uh, serving wherever He has us. That we would um, uh, look for ways to serve and to serve well. Mm. Well, Father, I do, in fact, pray those things right now for Trevin, that he and Karina would be um, the kind of parents that they know you want them to be, and Lord, that you would keep their relationship the priority, and that they would continue to love each other well and um, model that for their kids, and that their home 
would be the kind of place that their kids want to come back to. They want to bring their friends to. And Lord, keep keep their kids close to you. And Father, as 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 they do go farther from home, Lord, that in those years, and they're making more choices on their own, that the seeds have been planted and the growth that's happened, that that fruit would remain, Lord. And as it sounds like Trevin and Karina have some decisions to make about um, what's their next niche of service, um, Lord, the, the, the curse of gifting that that Trevin and Karina face is, is the, just the multitude of options, Lord. You've entrusted so many gifts to him. And Father, especially as he moves on into another decade of serving you, Lord, I ask that you would more and more focus him by not just what can I do, but really what must I do? Why did you create me? Why did you bring us together? Um, what is the unique calling? And that, Lord, he would not do the things that other people can do, but would more and more as he gets older, focus on the things that he alone can do, that you've called and gifted him to do, and give him a peace. Give him the ability to filter it out and to say no to more things than he says yes to so that he can be a hundred percent engaged in the things that are just the bullseye of your will for him. Thank you so much for our conversation today. And um, Lord, just continue to multiply his impact um, literally around the world, but most of all in his own home, in his own town. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Trevin, thank you so much for being with us today. This, this has you, been Bill. a treat to get to know you some. And looking forward to reading Multidimensional Leader. I also want to read Rethink Yourself. That one intrigues me too. And I um, hope God will bring us together to, to partner on some projects in the future. That would, be, that would be awesome, my friend. Well, thank you so much for having me on today. And uh, uh, so enjoyed the conversation. And I'm grateful for your ministry. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. You know, every time on Step Into the Story, it's a... It's a surprise. This is unscripted. We don't know exactly where God will take these conversations, but it's unmistakable in Trevin's life how his story has been not just intersected, but really overwhelmed by God's story. And I I pray that that would be all of our experience more and more. And um, Walk Through the Bible stands ready and eager to help you in that journey that um, we have many resources. Check those out at at walkthrough.org. And um, we look forward to seeing you next episode of Step Into the Story. Tell your friends about it. Leave a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next time on Step Into the Story. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for joining us for the Step Into the Story podcast, powered by Walk Through the Bible. We'd love to hear what you think by giving us a review on iTunes or Google Play. Also, don't miss a single episode by clicking the subscribe button. If you'd like more resources to help you explore and live God's word in your daily life, visit walkthrough.org. That's W-A-L-K-T-H-R-U dot O-R-G. Walk Through the Bible. Take a walk. Change the world.